Now it's time to talk about the family Anguidae, which are the eels. And we only have one species of eel here in Kentucky and here in North America, and that's the American eel. And these are a really cool fish. They're pretty easy to recognize. They've got that Anguilla form or eel-like body. That's where we get the word from. And the only fish we might confuse these with are a lamprey, but they're pretty obviously not a lamprey. They only have one gill slit. Uh, the eel has paired fins. Lampreys don't have paired fins. And of course, the lampreys don't have a jaw, but the eels do have a jaw. Now, these are the only catadromous species of fish in North America. And you remember that catadromous means the fish spends most of its life in fresh water and then migrates to salt water to spawn. The opposite being anadromous, which is what most of our fish do, our diadromous fish do. And that is that they, the anadromous fish spend most of their time in salt water, then ascend streams to spawn. Well, the eels are the only one that do this backwards. So the adults live in freshwater streams and rivers for years, 10, 20 years probably. There are some people that suggest that only the females migrate way upstream and that the males tend to stand, stay near the mouth of the river. And that's possible. Um, but I don't know if it's necessarily all that clear. And some have suggested that perhaps as the fish migrate, they actually change sex. So the longer they migrate, the more likely they will change into a female. Now, if that sounds weird to you, get used to it. Because fish change sex all the time. Not a lot of the fish around here, but it's not uncommon for fish to change from male to female or vice versa. But I don't know if there's any good evidence one way or the other on that. Now, what's very interesting is that these fish will migrate all the way to the Sargasso Sea when it's time for them to spawn. And so these fish go way up the Mississippi River. And when they're ready to spawn, they will travel down the Mississippi River through the Gulf around Florida to get to the Sargasso Sea. They might even, they, they're known to even travel over land. You know, again, when it's in rainy conditions and things like that. But if they can't get to flowing water, they can go across land to find flowing water. When they get to the Sargasso Sea, they spawn and then die. And they do this in really, really deep water, like 400 meters deep. So the Sargasso Sea, this is where the Bermuda Triangle is. It's off the East Coast. And presumably, this is where these groups evolved, and they sort of imprinted to this area, and that's why they continue to return to this area every year. You've got both European and American eels, and they all come back to the Sargasso Sea. And here's another map of that, a new map that I found. And so then once they spawn, the eggs float, and the larvae don't really have the ability to swim against the current, so they just float with the currents. And in this map, you can see where some of these major currents take these fish, and then when they get close to the shoreline, then they can find a river and go up that river and spend most of their life in that river. And so you can see there's one current that kind of goes below Cuba and that, <coughs> excuse me, into the Gulf and wraps around. And this presumably would be where the eels that we catch here in the Mississippi and the Ohio River by Kentucky, this is how they find the Mississippi River. As I mentioned, their closest relatives are European eels that also spawn in the Sargasso Sea. And for all these groups, once they spawn, the adults die. And then the eggs are hatch into leptocephali, which are, they're shaped like a willow leaf, a willow tree leaf. And they're transparent and they can't swim. And they just sort of drift along with the current. And so they don't have any protection other than being transparent. Hopefully something won't see them and eat them. Then they metamorphosize, they turn into what are known as glass eels, which is a little bit more pigmented 
and has a little bit more ability to swim. And then to Elvers, which is the juvenile form of the American eel that's pigmented and can swim. And those Elvers will then get into the river and develop into adults. What's interesting is the timing for the two species is perfect. So for the American eels, they don't have far to drift before they hit those rivers. And so it takes them about a year until they drift to the river and their development takes about a year until they turn into elvers and can swim up the river. Whereas the close relative, the European eel, has to do the same thing, but it has three years until it's going to hit the European coast because they're so much farther away. And so their development is that much slower. It's kind of cool. Now, this is a species that, again, is in a lot of trouble. And just like all our other species we talked about that make long migrations up the rivers, excuse me, the construction of dams has a serious impact on them. Again, the dams block their migrations. The dams change the habitat. Um, you also got water pollution. There are lots of challenges to the American eel. Um, their populations are in rapid decline. And they have been considered for listing as an endangered species. They haven't been listed yet. It often doesn't go anywhere. But I've heard a couple times where they've proposed listing them. And I bet within my lifetime they will be listed because their numbers are dropping off precipitously. Now another factor um, that's working against the American eel is that they're considered a delicacy in Europe and especially Japan. And if you ever heard of unagi, that's a eel. Now the Japanese um, have their own eel, the Japanese eel, but those numbers drop and so they start to look to other eels like uh, the American eel to replace them. Um, Korea, some of these other places, I think they're popular as well um, in East Asia. And so this is another challenge for this group that's in trouble. Now, there aren't enough adults to sustain a commercial fishery um, for these other countries, to export to these other countries. And again, due to the aforementioned problems because of dams and water quality and that, you just don't have enough adults out there to make it worth your while to go catch them and ship them overseas. So what um, happens, what people do, is they catch those glass eels or the elvers um, when they're coming up the river, when they first hit the river. At this size, they're a lot smaller, they're easier to handle, they're easier to catch, there's lots of them. And so then these live uh, larval eels are shipped over to Japan and um, the culturist will then raise them to adults. Now you can get Right now, um, I found some references that suggest you can get thousands of dollars, $2,000, $3,000 a pound for those elvers. So there's lots of incentive to take them. The aquaculturists, like I said, will take those larval fish, grow them to adults, and then use those adults to satisfy the, the European and the Japanese uh, market. But, um, you know, there's not a whole lot known about this species, and we do know that their numbers are crashing, and so this can be kind of a controversial thing, and it is a controversial thing right now. Should we allow people to take these larval fish and um, raise them for this market? Um, there's no resolution for it right now, but this is one of those issues that's out there in the fisheries world. So this is what that Leptocephalus larvae looks like, kind of shaped like a willow leaf. And you can see it's clear. And these glass eels are also pretty much clear, but I think they have a, a little bit different shape and they have they can swim a little better, I believe. Uh, you can see the hearts here. So I think at this stage in, in their life where their organs are developing and their organs are starting to pigment up, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to be transparent if your organs can be seen. And so then they get fully pigmented up and turn into elvers. And these are the young eels, which will ascend and get into the rivers, and then they will develop into adults. Now, the last thing I want to show you is just a recipe that I caught. Again, eel 
is not super popular here in the United States. And if this is how they prepare it, I don't think it's going to catch on. This is a recipe for a, a classic recipe for jellied eels. And you can read this um, and just look at the cooking instructions. You take the eel and you skin it and you season it with nutmeg. Um, cut it into pieces and boil them. And then after you boil the fish for an hour, you pull the fish out and you add some gelatin and make a jelly out of the fish gravy that's still in the pot. Then you serve that jelly over the fish cold uh, with a green salad and sliced gherkins, which is sliced pickles. So you eat this eel jellied cold with pickles. That does not sound appealing to me, but hey, I'm a picky eater. Um, but anyway, I just think that's interesting. This is a great fish. Um, it's super interesting, the long distances that they migrate um, just to spawn. But again, another fish that probably needs some protection. Their numbers are declining. Um, so we'll take a look at some of these later on in lab so you can identify them. Let me know if you got any questions, and I'll see you later.